Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And all of a sudden, a new trading month. I know, but we didn't exactly sell in May and go away either. No, it does not appear that way. Uh, let's get to the biggest stories right now in the more than $12 trillion global ETF industry. And as we hit a new month, we're going to take a look at the flows and what it tells us about investor sentiment ahead of the Fed and, of course, a big payrolls report. And after the SEC paves the way for the eventual launch of Ether ETFs, we speak to old friend of the show, Todd Rosenbluth from Vetify, about his new survey tied to crypto acceptance. And we drill down into one of my favorite ETFs, CALP, along with other cash cow funds with Sean O'Hara. He is the president of Pacer. ETFs. And as always, Eric Belchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence, he's here with us now looking at the flows. Eric, what do you got? Yeah, there is no selling in May going on in the ETF flows, at least amongst ETF investors. We look at the one-week flows, and it's, pr it's pretty bullish. The top of the leaderboard, you've got uh, SPY, VU, uh, TLT is in there. That's interesting. That is a return of that fight the Fed trade a little bit. SPYG is there. That is a uh, growth uh, ETF. And VGT, uh, Vanguard Tech. Uh, that's an interesting one to see there. But that's you look at that, it's pretty bullish overall. Go to the outflows, though, and there is a little bit of an unwind of that sort of NVIDIA trade we saw last week where money flew into the queues. And then you see there's two semiconductor ETFs on there. That's been really overheated, and I think a lot of people taking some profits there. Um, but, you know, we're almost in the midway part of the year, and I wanted to look at the issuers, you know, the, the horse race by issuers. And, you know, what we're looking at here is Vanguard, once again, just utter domination, almost double anybody else. Then you got BlackRock. BlackRock, by the way, 25% of that number is the Bitcoin ETF. So if they didn't launch that, Vanguard would be triple anybody else. Invesco up there, they're show having a good showing this year. JP Morgan, usually the top five lately. And Fidelity, they're usually not there, but the Bitcoin is half of that number. Uh, so it's interesting to see how the Bitcoin has kind of impacted the leaderboard, except for Vanguard, which can just continues to hoover in cash like no tomorrow. So uh, let's uh, look at the uh, issuer horse race, Katie. Yeah, it is just fascinating there. Let's uh, keep this conversation going with Todd Rosenbluth. He is head of research over at Vetify. Great to see you in person. Great to be here. Thanks. Let's talk about the horse race uh, because it is amazing. You think about just the leaps and bounds that Vanguard is making in terms of the flows, even with that big hit that BlackRock had in terms of the Bitcoin ETF. BlackRock still has a narrow lead over Vanguard when it comes to total assets, but when does that actually flip? Starting with an easy question. When? What date and what time yeah, it could should give happen? Yeah, an exact date and time, that would be great. That would be a challenge, but I love watching this as well. We've got two industry leaders that continue to gain as the pie uh, grows and as we get more competitive. I, it will happen at some point. I don't know when it will be. But it's exciting to see the product development. At, you know, we have a new CEO coming in at Vanguard. We're likely to see a shift in focus. We at Vetify think we're going to see some greater focus on active management. BlackRock this year has also seen some net outflows to some of their trading-oriented fixed income products. So HYG, the high yield bond ETF, LQD, the investment grade corporate bond ETF, those have seen net outflows. That's weighing down a bit of the success that BlackRock has had. Okay, so you mentioned the new CEO over at Vanguard. We're talking about Salim Ramji, of course, who was formerly the global head of iShares at BlackRock, now moving over to Vanguard. How do you expect him to change it up, and is he going to be very aggressive in making sure that Vanguard keeps its uh, number one spot in terms of flows and maybe overtake BlackRock uh, in terms of overall assets? So I think it's going to be an evolution under Ramji, not a revolution. And as a result, we're going to see... Lots of the same things. Vanguard is going to continue to offer broad asset allocation products, relatively cheap. I don't think we're going to see a new wave of products coming. But where we will see changes, there'll be active management. Vanguard recently, in December, launched a couple of active core and core plus fixed income ETFs that have been popular. We've seen growing demand for actively managed ETFs. Vanguard has a huge heritage in active management just in mutual fund land. So I think we're going to see Vanguard evolve into more of an active ETF provider. And we saw earlier on the flow chart, JP Morgan and Fidelity are further ahead in terms of active ETFs. And let's talk about JP Morgan. Uh, you know Brian Lake pretty well. He moved to Goldman Sachs, right? This is like, you know, a division rival. This should be interesting. Goldman has kind of fallen on hard times with ETFs, let's be honest. JP Morgan's still obviously doing well. Do you think this changes that? In a year from now, if you come back on, could we see Goldman in the top five? 
Well, we certainly will see them higher up than they are today in terms of the overall flows. I think it will take a little bit of time uh, before we see changes happening at Goldman. But I think we're going to see the best of Goldman become available in the ETF structure the way that we've seen that with J.P. Morgan. They brought their active expertise not only in covered call products, but throughout the broader franchise. I think that's what Brian Lake is going to be able to do well of get everybody on or most people on board in the ETF space. I think that's why he's being brought in. Goldman is a player to watch in the year ahead. Let's broaden out a little bit, zoom out from this conversation, because we're talking about Vanguard, of course, we're talking about J.P. Morgan and Goldman. Uh, it just feels like we're seeing a lot of C-suite shuffling in the ETF industry. You remember, of course, Anapoglia from Invesco going to State Street. Uh, you just see all these players moving around at the very highest ranks. And we talk about industry growth all the time in the terms of flows, assets, the number of products launched. And I don't know, the way I've been thinking about this C-suite reshuffling is it's another sign of maturation in the space. But I'm curious how you read it, what you make of it. So I, I would agree with you, but I want to just make sure we're using the word the same way in a positive way. So to me, it's, it's a positive sign of maturation. We continue to see ETF industry growth. I do think that not everybody is going to be climbing as high up as fast as they want to. And as a result, Goldman Sachs is a good example of it. They, they found somebody internally. But what we've seen is people continually move and bounce around. Many of the heads of ETF businesses used to work at BlackRock or Vanguard or State Street. It's a, it's a small and growing community. Uh, again, I'm here in part because <laughs> I, this, these are ETF friends of mine. Now, ETF friends of yours are talking a lot about crypto these days. Yeah, one in particular one is in to particular, the left of me exactly. right now. Exactly. <laughs> you guys conducted a survey recently of financial advisors uh, asking them for their take on crypto. What did you learn? What surprised you? So it's the talk of the ETF industry. It's certainly been the talk of certain parts of social media. We wanted to hear from advisors about does this make sense? Is this something they're interested in? Uh, and the data that we had was, was quite compelling to me. There's about one-fifth of the audience doesn't want anything to do with crypto at all. They, they stop talking about it and focus on something else. There's about one-quarter of the audience that was really excited and eager to buy in. And I think that's why we've seen strong inflows from BlackRock, from Fidelity, from Invesco and other firms. And then there was that healthy middle. Some people who were maybe, they were interested in learning about it, they wanted, they were more curious, uh, or they liked, about, liked it, but they wanted more education. And that's something we at Vetify are working to do, of increase awareness and education. We're not saying this is the right product to be in your portfolio, but if it does make sense in your portfolio, what are the risks, what are the rewards, how can, they, how can an Ethereum or a spot Bitcoin ETF make sense? And so that was part of the conversation we had. So speaking of surveys, I'm old enough to remember when ESG was what everybody apparently wanted in the surveys, right? Advisors were like, more ESG. Now, fast forward to this year, ESG, obviously a lot of outflows. And get this, that 25% of all the closures this year are ESG ETFs. They only make up 1% of the assets. What happened? Well, it's still showing up in the surveys. The late annual survey that comes out uh, from the institutional investors, they're still interested in ESG. ESG has historically been favored more by institutional investors. But I would share that it's working from a performance standpoint. So the uh, Spider S&P 500 ESG ETF, the ticker is EFIV, over the last three years is outperforming SPY, SPY, by 150 basis points on a three-year basis. So it would have helped investors had they bought in and stayed. It's still a billion-dollar ETF. And we are seeing clean energy ETFs pop in the past month. So the Invesco Solar ETF, TAN, the Alps Clean Energy ETF, ACES, uh, is up double digits. But Pete, you're right. People aren't buying it. Some of the industry closed. They didn't close as fast as I think you had expected, but they closed faster than I would have expected. So I was right. <laughs> well, I, I earned a steak dinner as a result of the time period that we had. So I, I think the, your credit card bill shows otherwise. All right. I think that's a really neat place to end it. Uh, Todd, <laughs> it is always such a delight to have you on. Great to see you again. Our thanks, of course, to Todd Rosenbluth of Vetify. Now, coming up, investors pulling away from China ETFs, why it raises concerns over the strength of a recent stock rebound. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. It's time now for the ETF Brief, where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with a ticker shortage. I love this chart so much. In blue, these are the new funds that have four character tickers. We were talking about this a little bit with Will Rind last week, that basically there's so many ETFs that they're having to push out how many characters are actually in the ticker. In orange, you can see those three character tickers, and uh, they were much more common around 15 years ago. You think about some of the OG ETFs like SPY, they all have three tickers. But of course, as ETFs have grown, so too have the number of characters. Let's also talk about TMF. This is also one of my favorite funds. This is the uh, Direction Fund. It's basically three times exposure on TLT. And you can see it has just done terribly over the past five years or so, down about 80% in price. But even still, I mean, money has just poured into this thing. Uh, so it's been a very fun story to watch. But let's talk about outflows to end this little segment. Let's talk about China outflows in particular, because China ETF outflows were the largest by in more than a year in May, you can see $4.2 billion exited from those funds, Scarlett. And like I said, most in over a year. Yeah, it's interesting given the uh, performance in Chinese stocks. So let's talk more about this with Bloomberg's Carolina Wilson. Carolina, what is behind the this, I guess, urge to sell in, in China? So the funds that we're talking here about here are ETFs that are listed in and trading in China. And so as Katie mentioned, that category has seen about $4 billion worth of outflows in May. That was the first month of outflows in 15. Also, to give you an idea of the magnitude here, that's more money coming out that then went into the strategies mm -hmm. in the two months prior. So a very strong sort of knee-jerk snapback reversal there. And that's happening because traders here are really doubting the strength of the recent market rally. Uh, you know, we've seen Chinese stocks have this massive rally since they hit that February bottom. And that was really sort of bringing in a lot of traders back into that category. And now we're seeing them pull out mostly because sort of the expectation that there was going to be this policy support in China for the property sector starting to deflate a bit. And we also saw a pretty disappointing earnings season across emerging market companies, and China was no exception to that. Well, it's really interesting because, like you mentioned, I mean, we're talking about Chinese ETFs here, but if you take a look at U.S.-listed China ETFs, it's a different story. It's such an interesting bifurcation, right? Because we just mentioned big outflows out of the China-listed products. When we look at the U.S.-listed ETFs, I really see some very bullish positioning there. We, we're looking at a ticker like MCHI, which is a China stock-specific ETF listed in the U.S. After months of outflows, that fund in May saw very strong inflows. EMXC, the ever-popular EMX China vet that sort of took the investor world by storm in the past 18 months. After these nonstop inflows, it's seen radio silence. So mm -hmm. No new cash has come in since like May 8th into that strategy, which to me really signals, at least for the U.S. traders, some bullish positioning. And I think the bifurcation here comes in because for U.S. traders, Chinese stocks were so severely underowned for so long that they really started to come back on the back of this rally. They're starting to add a little meat and position there. And also, I think they're a little less sensitive and maybe on the mark for some of the headline news, which the locals in mainland China, which we see with the China-listed strategies, maybe are a little more sensitive to. So when we talk about the outflows out of those China ETFs, are we talking about um, individual investors, uh, or are we talking about fast money, professional investors? Yeah, so it's, it, I think it'll depend on the product. It also is going to depend on this timeline. So when we see such a sharp reversal, mm -hmm. here we see these very strong inflow, outflows out of after inflows, I think that is more indicative of fast money trading. So these are traders that are looking to capitalize on a short-term move, on a headline, maybe on a specific technical level. The true sea change of sentiment coming from retail investors, I think, we're going to see when we see some money come out of other single country products. Like if we saw outflows out of India ETFs, which we haven't seen, and inflows into uh -huh. China, that's more indicative of a sea change move. All right, so something to watch for, certainly. Carolina, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Carolina Wilson. Now, still ahead on ETF IQ, we drill down into cash cow ETFs with Sean O'Hara, president of Pacer ETFs, next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu, along with Katie Greifeld. And Eric Balchun is from Bloomberg Intelligence, back with us now for today's drill down, where we focus on one ETF. Eric, what do you got? Katie, today we are looking at CAF, C-A-L-F. A lot of people know this ETF. 
Um, there's an ETF awards every year, and this was the ETF of the year uh, for 2023. It's taken in flows for 40 straight months. So total grassroots uh, blockbuster hit. It's simple. It just looks at stocks that are smaller and have a lot of free cash flow, and they divide by price to get ones that have a higher yield. That's the premise. It's pretty easy to understand. You can see here it's not active. So it's a passive fund, 59 basis points. It's about seven years old. Let's look at the holdings here to get an idea of what you're buying here. Essentially here, you're going to get a quality tilt here, right? Because if a small cap has a lot of cash flow, uh, it's going to lean you to a quality companies. And you can see here, uh, some of these companies here are, are going to be on the quality side. Uh, you can see there's 100 stocks in the holding, so very, very concentrated versus, say, the Russell 2000. Let's look at the performance. And you can see why the flows have come in basically every month since the pandemic is that the performance is unbelievable. It's up 109% over the past five years. So look at this. IWM is the small cap index. It's blowing it away. But here's the thing. It's also beaten the S&P 500. Think about that. Small caps have been lagging greatly, but for a small cap group of stocks to beat the S&P is remarkable. And it's also beat the small cap quality factor, which shows you that there's some really interesting stock picking going on here that has just worked like a charm, Katie. So not surprised to see uh, the flow action in this ETF. Great, Eric, thank you so much. And joining us to talk about this ETF, I'm thrilled to say we have Sean O'Hara. He is the president of Pacer ETFs. And it really feels like with CAF and also with its uh, bigger brother, older brother, I don't know what you call it, but cows, right. that you've really captured lightning in a bottle here. I mean, you take a look at the flows. Uh, CAF in particular taking, what, close to $3 billion so far this year. I guess my first question would be, who is buying into this fund? Is this retail players that, you know, have found this fund, or are you getting that institutional crowd as well? Oh, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It's good to see everybody again. We, we focus on the financial advisors. So our, our flows come from financial advisors, Merrill, Morgan, Wells, UBS, LPL, registered investment advisors. Um, you know, you said lightning in a bottle. You know, eight years or so ago, we sort of had this idea that we wanted to redefine what value was. Traditional value forever had been like low price to book stock investing. The, the stock market's changed a lot. There's not much tangible value, tangible book value left. It's all intangible assets that drive prices. And so by disconnecting from that price to book and inserting free cash flow yield, which is just a different way to measure the value of a company, we launched a whole series of ETFs on a theory, if you will, that have actually delivered exactly the kind of returns that we thought. So we've been very, very fortunate. You said on a theory, but we're in a market environment in which everyone is prioritizing free cash flow. When earnings reports come out, yeah. everyone goes to the free cash flow line. What is it about the current environment that makes investors prioritize this particular metric? Well, I, th I think you're hearing a lot about it in the ETF world. It probably doesn't help hurt that we've got $30 billion worth of assets or $33 billion worth of assets in a series of ETFs that use free cash flow. But it's more a relevant measure of a company's worth today. So free cash flow yield, for example, is a free cash flow a company generates divided by its enterprise value. Just how much am I paying to buy the whole company? If I did that, what would I get in return? And so you can get a better look into what's really going on at a company. And then the other thing that we do that's really kind of important in this process, I, Zarek was talking about CAF earlier, we exclude names in the broad indexes that we draw from, like the S&P 600 or the Russell 1000, for example, that don't make money. And in the S&P 600, 25% of those names don't make money. Mm. And so by eliminating the losers, you have a much different overall view for what those companies look like and what your fund looks like. In small cap land, they're highly levered. 30% or so of all of the earnings that are being generated in small cap land now because the Fed has been raising interest rates are being used to just pay debt service. So as the Fed has been raising interest rates, it's been harder and harder for small caps. And the other half of their debt is permanent debt. And permanent debt in small cap land is like five to seven year paper. So that's now starting to roll over. So even if we get a reversal from the Fed and they lower interest rates, that other tranche is going to start to pile on at higher interest mm -hmm. rates. So we take a slightly different view of small cap. We don't want to own the whole index. We only want to own 100 profitable stocks that have excess free cash flow. So every now and then people talk about ETFs, you know, owning too much of the market. It's usually not really the case. But here, CAF is 25, owns more than 25% of the shares of Central Garden and Pet Company. Yeah. There's a couple stocks. It's become almost like a big fish in a small pond, right, with small caps. 
Um, what's going on there, and will that get unwound at some point? Yeah, I mean, we rebalance, as you know, every 90 days. And so, you know, in, in CAF in particular, we have to be very, very careful about the rebalance process. We're different than a mutual fund in that if we have to change a name, we're not going to outright sell that stock. And so we've been able to figure out how to work with the market makers in order to have no very little price impact when we have a high concentration in the small cap fund in a relatively small name. But you'll see those names change from time to time. And then the other thing that's important, Eric, about this is that there's two things that are different. One is we don't wait by market cap, we wait by free cash flow. And we cap every name at 2% when we rebalance. We're not going to have a 15% position in a very small, small cap stock. Well, Eric does raise a really interesting and important point. I mean, when you're talking about the small cap universe, your fund is close to $10 billion right now. And even with that rebalance, I mean, you own such a, a big proportion of some of these much smaller names. How big is too big? Is that something that you're planning for potentially? Well, I dare everybody to send us that much money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's, there's probably a number. I think it's out on the horizon quite a bit because of the way ETFs operate. You know, we can essentially send our whole book to a market maker and they'll work it for the week for us as opposed to being a mutual fund where you have to outright sell. So there's probably a number somewhere down the line, but I think we're not even very close to it today. You know, you talked about um, free cash flow as redefining value. You also have executives tying their pay to free cash flow. Warner Brothers Discovery's David Zaslav, for instance, reportedly his bonus is tied to free cash flow. What do you make of that, using that as a metric? Well, you know, earnings are just an accounting function, right? You can make earnings almost anything you want by working that all of these different calculations, bringing forward re revenue and taking write-offs and so forth. Free cash flow, you can't lie about it. It's all of the excess cash that's available at the end of the year from a company after they've paid all of their expenses. And so it's a much better, I think, measurement of how high quality a stock is as opposed to earnings. And earnings, as I said, they can be manipulated. You just can't manipulate free cash flow. Um, and, and so we think that's probably what's driving it more than anywhere. If, if I was a shareholder, I would rather have a, a, an executive compensated based on the amount of free cash flow they generated as opposed to what they could make the earnings look like from quarter to quarter. All right, Sean, uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Great to have you back with us. Hope to do this again soon. Our big thanks, of course, to Sean O'Hara of Pacer ETFs. And if you just can't get enough of ETFs, good news. You can just subscribe to my weekly ETF newsletter that covers the industry. That comes out at 2 p.m. on Fridays. You can sign up at Bloomberg.com slash newsletters. But sadly, for now, that does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld, along with Scarlett Fu and Eric Balchunas, and this is Bloomberg.